Okay. Well, but, uh, if you'd go. like to keep going. Come on, just yeah, keep going. You can start the show officially. Why okay. have I got to start the show? It's well, your you're show. The guest. No, it's, yeah, so it's traditional for the host to start the show. Well, here's the thing. You're here. Chris is here. All right, so, so we're talking, this is the last show of the year. <laughs> what? You can ask me to do this. All right, okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. Everyone's a fucking critic around here. So we're talking about the, uh, the best shows from this year. And by the way, your area here looks fantastic. It does look good, doesn't it? I'm also wearing the traditional drive Christmas sock. <laughs> it looks like you were hurt skiing. It does look like I've been, I've actually, there's nothing wrong with my foot at all. I just, there wasn't a hat, so, I, and I couldn't put the sock on my head. Right. Which would have been absurd, so I put it on my foot. Um, it was a, a nice thing to do. By the way, the corduroy. What do you think to the green corduroy? It's fantastic. Yeah, with the purple jumper? Well. Jumper, it's called. Jumper. It's a sweater? Can or you say, jump? say jumper? Jumper. Jumper. <laughs> Mill mucker. So well, let's start out because we asked you guys uh, if you had any questions for Chris. And there are a number of questions because you are you're hardly ever here. Har hardly ever here you are. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yet you are here now and, uh, and uh, we get to ask you all kinds of questions from the readership. You put it so, you've put it so concisely. <laughs> So we asked the audience to ask you some questions since you were going to be here on the couch today. Can we ask you some questions as well? You can ask me anything you'd like. Okay. So but, I, I, what I'll do is I'll make up the questions to you. Okay. Because it's clearly what you're going to do. Yes. And we can go back and forth. I mean, I don't think people really want to know about me. But they, they do. Okay. And I do. Well, well. And the guys behind the cameras well, do. This is interesting. Well, this could yeah. be fun. Okay. It has to be reciprocal, Michael. Yes. Well, it will be. Okay. Here we go. Um, Let's see, do you keep a logbook of what you've driven for how long, like aircraft, aircraft pilots do? Says Umberto Volci. No, but it's something I wouldn't mind doing. One year, I bought a digital camera in 2001 when they were new fangled things, and I was going to take a photograph of every single car that I drove, and I did it for four months, and then I lost the camera. <laughs> so I lost so the record. That was, and that was um, it. But it was Mike Duff, I remember Mike Duff, of, of when he was at Autocar, I think, did the same thing. And he put this lovely collage up of all the cars he'd driven. It's a very good idea. Um, but I did, I did once keep an idea of mileage, but I found it too terrifying because I did something like 120,000 miles in that year. Wow. And then I thought I didn't want to remember that. It was yeah. probably too much. So good idea. Don't do it. Probably should do it. Um, it's a very nerdy hmm. thing to do. The only other person I know who's done it to a, a huge extent was uh, Jason Camisa from Road and Track has a, a, a spreadsheet going back like 50 years. And Does he's he? not even 50. He's got every car he's ever driven. In, I Jay, mean, Jason just, strikes me as someone who's very, very organized. Absolute, though. unbelievable detail, mm. driving notes on every single thing he's ever driven. Has he? Yeah. God, he must, he must find me so unrigorous. Sorry, Jason, <laughs> but carry on. <laughs> okay, uh, favorite car for daily track and weekend asks Cuba Dulian. Daily track and weekends? Hmm. Favorite car? Does, does it ex exist? It, if I was going to have a daily car that I had to track and use at weekends, hmm, well, you're, you're always looking to compromise somewhere, aren't you? So I'd probably compromise a bit on the roadside. I'd probably have something like a GT3. Holy shit. Well, how, how hard is that question? <laughs> I'd have a GT3. It's the Luminating. answer to every question. Fuck every question you ask me. Yeah, I think you asked the question wrong. What do you mean? Different I asked the question right. Favorite car for daily track and weekend? I guess there are three different cars. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking guy. Bucket of spunk. <laughs> right, come on then. So what do we want three cars? Favorite car for daily. Favorite car for daily? Yes. Um, right, it changes by the minute because we all have different things. Right at the moment, I'd like to run an M5. Carry on. Okay, uh, track. Uh, I would probably have a 3.8 RS 997 Gen 2. Mm. With a load of Manti bits and a different suspension setup. Carry on. <laughs> so a tuned, a tuned car. It would be, yeah. Um, okay, so weekend, I guess weekend would be just flogging around your... Um, my, well, it depends what you village. want to do in weekends. Because I'd been driving on the track during the week for my day job, I'd probably like to have a 1965, were they built then? Mercedes 300 SEL 6.3. I'd have a black one with that lovely sort of tan velour upholstery, oh. and I'd just smoke around in it. That's fair. I mean, not quite the 
Canyon Carver or your no? Were they making the, them in '65? Those they were, weren't they? Not, not the 6.3. No, they 68, were late, 68. 68. Sorry, I got that completely wrong. Yeah, so it was okay. 68. Yeah, come on. Um, uh, why are you so brown? Asks um, Georgie Bacandaze. Why am I so brown? It's just very a, brown. It's just a genetic thing. It happens. <laughs> you have genetic happens to the wor- Happens to the worst of us. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, what is, th- ooh, I don't know if we should talk about this. Ooh. What is the biggest automotive sin you can commit or have committed? Ooh. Oh, it's simple. I sold a four liter RS. Oh. Is there a bigger right. sin than that? Okay, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Scarabaggio asks Do you hate American cars as much as other British auto journalists? Wait a minute. Does he, is he asking you, do you hate American cars? As much as you hate other British journalists? <laughs> or is yeah, he he's, asking you? He's, he's got himself in a grammatical tiz there. Yes. Um, no, I don't. I mean, there's some American cars that I don't like very much. Um, but I, on the whole, love American cars. Of course I do. You know I do. I've always demonstrated that. Mm. I, I quite like the Corvette. Uh, you I really enjoyed last year's GT500 and the ZR, uh, Z, what was that? ZR1. ZR1. I thought that was great. Um, they just, I think you have to put them in context, don't you? I think American cars are great at doing what American cars do. What, where I start to challenge them a bit is when people tell me that the latest you know, Cadillac is better than a Mercedes S-Class at being mm. a very comfortable car. It probably isn't, but they have many things going for them. Yes. God, this is a really long question. I'm an aspiring auto journalist, and how did you get started? Um, I used to write letters to Autocar Magazine saying, can I have a job? And they would say no, really? but they let me come every single summer to do a week of being an ashtray. And I was a very good ashtray. And what, then what, what eventually, is that? What, that's a, that's some vernacular from your side of the pond. Well, what, I was just well, you know, I would just basically do nothing. That's some. I was utterly useless. I was below the bottom of the food oh, chain. Oh, so you were an intern. Yeah. Well, not even. Sorry, an, I wasn't even an intern. I was just. I'd just turn up. So an ashtray. Where, where did that come from? What's that mean? Why are we dwelling on that? You know, <laughs> wait, 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 no, so, so in other words, I'd just sort of sit there and people would... Anyway, so, yeah. so, so basically, perseverance, writing was the key thing then. Of course, now there's a bit more of an emphasis on standing in front of a camera, but in those mm. days, it was proving you could write because everyone would turn up and say, I want to drive cars. And they'd say, well, we know you want to drive cars, but can you write about cars? And I categorically proved that I couldn't. And then a few people tried to show me how to do it. And then we got a bit of a handle on that. And then someone gave me a job. You see, and that's the advice I try to give because I'm kind of sh- in front of a camera, but I know how to write. Now, and now, you're fishing for compliments, I'm just Michael. Mad. <laughs> but I can confirm Tell you're shit in front of a Mr. camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do know how to write, which is the only thing I can do. Which would I'm basically unemployable in almost any other aspect, but I can write, and that's what I would suggest is learning how to write. I feel very modest about you can, your skills you can behind get, the keyboard, Michael. You can get a lot of. Uh, you can get a lot of leeway in life if you know how to write. Things. I think you can. And I think ultimately this job is still about writing, isn't it? Yeah. So if you can write, get on a blog, create your blog, get people, you know, get on Twitter, get people seeing what you're doing and make sure it's good. All right, now one last question. Where did you get your nickname, Monkey? Okay, let's clear this one up. It is not an ethnic slur. Well it, was, it, well, it wasn't originally. It is now, obviously, but it wasn't <laughs> originally. Okay, so there's a very famous television show in the UK called Only Fools and Horses. Now, you would never have heard of that uh, if you're an American, but in England, it's probably the, one of the biggest comedy shows ever made. Enormous Christmas specials, God knows how many series, like 10 series of it. In it, a character called Del Boy, who's a famous, well, he's, a, he's an East End trader. He's a, he's a ne'er-do-well, petty criminal, let's say. Um, who uh, like uh, the Artful Dodger? Well, he's sort of a modern Artful Dodger okay, actually, but he's a, he's a lovable rogue, and in it, he gets in all sorts of scrapes with the law, and he's always trading, you know, low-level illicit goods and stuff like that, and he does a bit of car trading now and again, and he always goes on about certain characters in his life, but they never appear on the show, and there's a character who you never see on Only Fools and Horses, who sometimes has done a bit of trading with him, and, he's, and he'll be asked the question, "Where did you buy that rubbish from?" And he'll say, "I bought it off." Monkey Harris. Oh. Okay. So this character you never see called Monkey Harris on this famous comedy show. And one day, a school friend who's called Nick Howe, hello Skippy, came out with Monkey Harris. 
and it's stuck ever since and I've been called monkey. But there's wow. an obvious Simeon reference going on there. Right. Because when I'm brown in the summer, because I do tan up now and again. When you I look shave a, your hair. I look a bit like a monkey. Well, and I'm quite hairy as well. And you do eat a lot of bananas. I do love bananas. You've noticed that. I, I, noticed I do that. eat a lot of bananas. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's a, a tremendous, a tremendous number of bananas. I, I, you, I saw you go through at least a dozen. I like Baker's a, I do like a good banana. So there you go. That's clear banana yeah, for you. That's fantastic. So our favorite shows of this year that we've done, me and you, right here, sitting on these couches right here, in New York City, <laughs> in New York, um, tuned. What was your favorite tune? <laughs> Fucking tune. What was your, um, okay, well, it's an embarrassment of riches, isn't it? I would say, do I you know love. When you say that, when you say that, it sounds awfully sarcastic. Does but it? I, no, it's. No, well, I'm not being. And oh, Matt's, a, Matt's a big bloke, so I'm not going to piss him off, am I? <laughs> um, I would say, the st well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of good stuff there. The standout for me, um, Venom GT, I know that you recognised that earlier, but I would say the No Fucks Given RX-7 oh. was absolutely standout. Fantastic. I loved the concept of the car. I just thought, I think that tuned or tuned cars operate on two levels. I think they either have to be a piece of unobtainium that you couldn't imagine doing, either because they're so expensive or they're so harebrained that, you know, they're too crazy and therefore you just admire them from a distance. Or they need to be stuff that's tangible that you might attempt yourself. And I think the no f given, can I keep saying that? That's what it was, the no bleep Fox given, given yeah, yeah, okay. RX-7 was just a great, uh, it was just showed lateral thought someone with not too much money going out and doing something they wanted to do. And I love the irony of the fact that he sold it for a load of money after the show. People tend to compare supercars to works of art and worship them as such. From their finely sculpted lines to their superior engineering to the emotions they stir while behind the wheel, it's easy to understand why they inspire people so. And like fine art, the best supercars are all about the details. It has a 5 liter V8 like a Koenigsegg. It has leather bonnet straps, like a Pagani. It has lightweight body panels and a stripped interior, like a GT3 RS. It has an external speedometer, like an old muscle car. It has a big oil cooler, like a Corvette ZR1. It has a trunk-mounted battery, like a Bentley GT. It utilizes wood in its structure, like a Morgan. It has airplane style switches like an Aventador and a fire suppression system because from where we stand, this car is much more likely to catch on fire than any Ferrari ever built. What would it take for you to agree to test drive a car that makes nearly 400 horsepower, weighs less than a Mini Cooper, and was built by someone barely old enough to vote in their parents' driveway? If that sounds scary, that's because it is. If a car is the sum of its parts, then Corbin's first-gen RX-7 is a schizophrenic homeless man. It's ugly, dirty, weathered, and an all-around disaster. But, as often goes with these things, a car can be not only far more than the sum of its parts, but a brilliant representation of not only its creator, but also the environment in which it is created. And now it's time we meet this monster's creator, Corbin. He's only 19, but for the past few years has dumped every dollar he's earned delivering pizzas into his mischief mobile. Well, it's what started out as a 1984 Mazda RX-7 with a 12A and an automatic owned by someone who's probably dead now. But anyway, I got an ditch in Fresno for about $350, had to trailer it back, uh, listen to Johnny Cash the whole way, and I decided that I needed Something insane, you know, something that would try to kill me at any opportunity. You know, life wasn't exciting enough. Anyway, so I decided it needed a V8 and something that I could really have fun in the canyons with, not care about, beat on mercilessly, and that would hopefully take it without breaking. So that was the best of tuned. What about Musto? Big muscle, what's your favorite? Well, I love, Musto is such a large man. 
and some of these cars aren't built for people of that stature. So I love the one with the, tw the 1922 Ford Roadster where he has to sit sideways to be able to drive it just because he's about 6'12". How, how tall do you think, how tall a man he is? He's a, he's a big unit muster and we obviously a couple of months ago, we saw him almost get angry with someone, and, and you know, oof, that could have ended badly. So, oh, um, <laughs> no, he, he's um, that was a, that was a top episode. I have to say, also mid-engine Corvair. Oh, the Corvair was fantastic. Genius, genius, and and also for me, having a conversation with him about the dangers of of what what I was driving and the way I was driving, he was saying, well, you know, you're going sideways in in supercars really fast, must be dangerous, and I'm thinking. But you sit in a car with two engines, <laughs> right. appears to have no safety devices at all. I mean, basically, if that popped a water pump, it could kill you. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is the first on Big Muscle. And what I mean first, I mean, I'm driving on the right side of the car with the steering wheel on the left side of the car for the simple fact that I actually don't fit in the car. Now, some of you are gonna watch this and you're gonna say, well, don't you think this is irresponsible and not safe and everything else? And to you, I say, this car is a 1922 Ford. And so when you think about it, back in the day, it didn't need brake lights. No, it needed one brake light. It didn't need any turn signals. God knows it didn't have any seat belts. So we figured, well, what the hell? If I'm gonna drive it, why not drive it the most unsafe way that I can? No, I mean, honestly, that's not true, but I simply don't fit. And that's why I literally have to drive the car from this side. You know, now we were talking about it before. You gotta wonder, well, people back in the day, were they really this short? I'm not really sure of the answer. I mean, I'm 6'4", say 245, 250, right? And I'm trying to drive a car that was built for somebody on their best day that's 5'10". You know, here we are cruising along. I'm getting looks from everybody that's going past me because they're like, what the hell is going on here? But anyway, Let's bypass the fact that I'm on the wrong side of the car and get down to the nuts and bolts of this thing. 1922 Ford, powered by a flathead engine, two single barrel Stromberg carburetors. The suspension on this thing is as old school as they get. You gotta remember, this car is pushing almost 100 years old. So, you know, you've got these great torsion bar kind of shocks in these things. Not torsion bar, mind you, but torsion springs. They kind of go up and down and they flex and even out the ride of the car. And you combine that with the leaf springs and you know what? It's really not an unpleasant ride. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I have no idea how this review is going to be. Big muscle. So we can swept that sh under the rug. All right. <laughs> Fucking guy. All right. So big muscle. Now shakedown with Leo Parente. What do you think of, uh, of what he's done this year? I mean, what the f- <laughs> There he goes. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> there he is, and he just threw some he tape threw at some you. some reflective tape. What, you think what, you what a loaded question. What am I supposed to say? I think it's been a shambles. You have one of these. I think it's been a <laughs> fucking shambles. <laughs> oh. The Sorry, continue. The rapper's still on it. Continue. What were you saying? Just, this looks like a fucking crack party going wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> I think his trip to Spa. The trip to Spa, any, any, at any point where we can immerse Leo in the racing process, I love that because yeah. I, I, I've, I've met Terriers that are less fucking tenacious than him. So that's great stuff. Um, I also, the endless enthusiasm for racing. He's standing behind the camera at the moment, so I'm going to be really nice about <laughs> him. He's small, but he punches hard. A challenging racetrack, the weather, a 24 hour time lapse. The light shift into dusk happens gradually, but then, before you realize it, the track becomes a black space assaulted by a light show called Spa 24. And the racing takes on a look only around the clock endurance racing can deliver.
The Spa 24 holds true to all the traditions of sports car racing and the belief that having a good time is timeless. Enter the parties and the techno beat concert. Entertaining distractions, but the never ending track action remains the best show of all. So your, your little show, Chris Harris on Cars, isn't that delightful? Chris Harris on Cats. Chris Harris on Cats. <laughs> Chris Harris on Cats. Um, so obviously some standouts for you this year is driving two cars that I had on my wall, not the actual cars, but pictures of them, Ferrari F40 and Ferrari F50. Ooh. Ferrari F40 I had on my wall for 10 years, the F50 probably about six months. But um, Why did it get? I, I did something about the F50 that... Uh, that I didn't like, and, and I, I love your piece on it because you sort of teased out the reasons why the F50 is still one of the best sports cars ever built. But uh, you know, when you compare it to the F40, there are some things that, uh, that, that stood out to you. And I'm teasing it because I want you to talk about it, not me. Because it's my interesting, isn't it? Because we're all involved in the process of shooting our films and they take a bit of time to organise. So what presenters and people that produce these films tend to remember is the process of organising them and the shoot on the day, not the finished result. I don't tend to watch <coughs> all of the films. I have to see them before they go out, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that you feel the same way. I'm sure that Leo does about the stuff he produces. I'm sure that Matt and Mike as well remember more the process of the film than they do actually <coughs> the film itself. So really, I remember the owner, who knows who he is, and I should thank him again, because that was the coolest thing. In fact, what's the coolest thing about the whole F40, F50 film? It's the fact that there's an individual who sits there on the day, he was there on the day, and watches me treat those cars in a fairly aggressive fashion. In fact, there was there's some several comments on the film saying it's just profoundly wrong that I've driven the cars in that <laughs> manner. And to you, I say, I have nothing to say to you, in fact. You just... What the fuck is wrong with you? That's what I meant to say, Chris but I can't say that. But it's just ridiculous. They're there to be spanked. You've got to spank them, haven't you? But it's great to have an owner that's willing and who wants you to, be, to drive his car. Oh, so, like that. so, that's a fantastic So the, the, the abiding memory of that whole process is meeting an individual who, who contacted me and said, this is a nonsense, all this not driving cars properly. Drive these cars properly. Now, I've driven an F40 before, but I've not had the chance to absolutely spank one on a circuit. This is bucket list stuff. What's it going to be like? The F50 is a surprisingly gorgeous car, but it's very accurate, very competent. It feels like a little racing car. It doesn't want to be agitated. It wants you to treat it with respect and drive it smoothly. What's this thing going to be like? I'm led to believe they're quite unruly, these things. We got 480 horsepower, 1200 kilo. Jesus Christ, the boost! Yes, this is a serious car. Nothing like the noise, nothing like the throttle response. It's an animal, but it's so agile and it just throws you up the road. And 
You shouldn't be able to do that in an F40, should you? You just think about your angle and choose it. Look at that! Oh! Gear shift, lovely. Not as mechanical as the F40, as the F50s, but the performance, the torque. Oh, it's an animal. It's just got so much performance. You can see why they didn't want people figuring F50s, because this is quicker. The old car is quicker. Oh, I need one of these. This is the car I've been looking for all my life, I think. It's a total hooligan, but it's connected, and it's beautiful, and it's... And it's fast, and it's a challenge, and it's got a stick, and I'm in love! Brakes are good. I mean, what was the performance like in 1989? Yes, and it just surges. It couldn't be more different to the F50. You pin the throttle, wait for the boost to arrive. And because it's so mechanical, the way it boosts, if you hold the throttle steady, it still adds boost, which is moderately terrifying. Oh, wow. What a car. What did they think when they made this? They must have looked around and gone, we might as well give up. <laughs> oh. This is the one. This is the one. This is the one. I've never driven a Ferrari F50 before today. Let's try and debunk some of the myths about a car that was considered too slow and uninteresting and ugly after the F40 and not even worthy of comparison with the McLaren F1. If I think a load of... If I think some of that is complete cobblers. That's nice! gear change. I don't want to talk, I just want to enjoy the thing, but I have to talk. So, first things first, the engine, well the block is from a Formula One car. It revs to 8,500 RPM and it's a V12. It's a carbon tub and the rear suspension is hanging from the back of the engine gearbox case. This is just why we love cars, boys and girls. Why didn't people love this in the day? It's extraordinary! Oh. No ABS, no nothing. Sports cars should be like this. The chassis, well, quite a bit of understeer, I have to say. I'm sure you could dial some of that with some setup changes. The steering is quite slow, it's unassisted, it's heavy. But it is a little bit slow-witted for me. But I just love it. The pedals close together just roll off the brake and onto the throttle. I watch this taco ahead of me. The needle flicking up to 8,500 RPM and that noise! Wow! Yes! Wow! God knows how fast we're going. I'm not looking. like a racing car. It feels like a racing car. The engine's from a racing car. I wish it didn't have this sort of low and medium speed understeer, but I'm sure some tyres or some setup could get rid of that. You just have to not hurry the car too much. Get it into the turn. Use that amazing traction on the way out. It's a real challenge to drive. But as you can see, I love it! I love cars! It's 
does it feel, this is a question that someone, a couple of people asked, to drive a car that's worth so much, and yet you're in a race, you're wheel to wheel, you're not backing down, you're a racer, this is how racers do. But you're in a car that's worth more than I've ever made, nor will I ever hope to make, being fairly uh, unemployable outside of this chair. <laughs> and yet you're racing this car. As, as I, I tried to explain in the film, but I probably didn't do very well, you can conceptualise all of this stuff and think about it when you're outside of the car, and it's all there for you to think about and to worry about. But when you're in it and you're bolted in, and there's a car ahead of you that you want to catch, and there's a lot of cars in your mirror that you don't want to come past you, you just don't think about it. Yeah. I have to say, I vividly remember seeing a Lacey go up the inside of that lightweight E-Type and just hit it. And the smoke came back and it completely, I'd sort of lost my vision for a split second. You, there's a clip actually in the film where that happens. And I did think that was nuts. Yeah. Absolutely nuts when so I saw that For a that moment, happened. there was that one, well, what the hell am I doing? Well, that's worth 30 million pounds, yeah. the car that, that, um, that Lacey's driving. So I don't think you do consider it. And I think you're probably a better driver for not considering it. I don't think you're reckless. I think you'd probably don't temper your actions. We're all better at doing things if we do them instinctively. I don't know about you, but if I try and consciously drive at 65 miles an hour on the inside lane, I'm using so little processing power driving because I think the speed is so low that I probably get distracted and I fiddle with the radio and what have you. Yeah. But if I'm doing a normal speed, I'm probably concentrating the way I should be because I'm not, I'm not distracted by not behaving in a normal way. That's a good point. So, um, but wicked, I mean, I wicked just, things. I would take cars. it around once and just park it and, and walk away. I also, again, comes back to a great owner. You know, yeah. um, just like with the F40, F50, I've got an owner of a car who is very, very clear about what he wants to happen with the car. The message was, I want to win the race. Mm -hmm. You don't win the race by not trying to drive it very fast. It's true. And everyone else is doing the same thing. It does help when everyone else is doing the same thing. And it's pretty, you know, when you see people swapping paint in front of you, you think, well, I can't be doing it as roughly as them. The noise is instantaneous. My reaction's a bit slow, but we're away and hold fourth through the first turn. Then it's a crazy $50 million snake of sideways cars through Fordwater at 120 miles an hour on cold rubber. Touring car driver Rob Huff tries to bully it down the inside at no name, but I have the line into the left at St Mary's. The pace is frenetic. Each car's performance is wildly different over the course of the lap. I have brakes, corner speed and traction. The Cobras are just monsters in a straight line. And Jean Alessi and the Ferrari, well, he just looks wild. Lap two, Gary Pearson does me like a kipper into No Name. Then he does the same again to the Cobra on lap three, forcing it wide and allowing me to scuttle through behind him. Now the race feels set and the car feels fantastic. I can stay with the leaders without pushing too hard. Maybe I can play a waiting game and pick them off. Maybe I should just sit back and watch a lazy play dodgems with the GTO. At the end of lap four, the top eight cars are covered by six seconds. Lap six, the safety car comes out because someone's tapped the tyres at the chicane. The safety car at Goodwood is a Ferrari 275 4 cam in Jallo Fly. You couldn't make it up.
when it peels off, I get a chance. The Cobra and E-Type are slow at the restart. I get a run and nip into second place. I'm quite excited about this, but need to catch that Cobra. It looks like an animal from where I'm sitting, laying down black lines at over 100 miles an hour. It doesn't want to change direction at Woodcut though, so I send a dummy at No Name, they go for it at Goodwood, and it works! I can't believe it, I'm leading the TT! But I'm not. Too hot into the chicane, masses of oversteer for the crowd, and the bloody cobra goes back past me. But we get the job done next time around and then start to pull away. The car is feeling immense. So much confidence and balance. And with the fuel load lightning, the handling just gets better and better. Are we done with Goodwood? Yes, we're done. I'm not done with Goodwood. I could do it all day, but we must talk about something else. <laughs> um, Driven, what's your favourite episode of Driven? Well, JF's sitting right here. It's definitely, for me, inside Koenigsegg. Uh, what's happening behind the walls of that place is tremendous. It was the crazy valve train episode that did that my head was in. The one. That was the one that had me thinking, <sighs> where's that coming from? It was all a bit right. sci-fi. Yeah. And I have a complicated history with that company because obviously I potentially offended him and them once. I didn't mean to, but I did. How, how was that? Well, we're not going to get into that now, but okay. I still think that the, I you still think, I think the, the idea of going into forensic detail about a car company like that, a really interesting car company, is, is one of the great strengths of Drive. We've got time and space to do it. Yeah. So, you know, you're never going to find that. I'm picking up Drive here now, an internet video as a concept, because you, what even Discovery or a big TV channel can't go and do multi-episodes the way we can. Yeah. And I thought the Koenigsegg thing was great. And it, they all did massive views, which shows there's an appetite for it, which means we can go and do more. And we are going to do more. So everyone's great, including JF, who's sitting there. So now I'm going to show you something which we're working on for the future, which I personally find very, very interesting in many aspects. So what this is, is this is what we call an actuator. It's a, it's a free valve actuator. Most of you who are familiar with uh, combustion engines and, and especially car engines know that there, there are camshafts involved to move uh, the valves inside the cylinder head. And uh, these valves, they have been controlled by camshafts for the last 100, 150 years or something like that. But it's very restrictive really, especially if you have multi-cylinders and you want to have a rev range to go through with, with the efficiency and power. Uh, because when you have a camshaft, you basically lock up all the cylinders in the same line to do pretty much the same thing. There are coming systems now which give some flexibility. You can tweak the angle a little bit compared to the crank of the engine and you can slide them sideways like Audi is doing to shut off cylinders now. So it's getting better and better, but it's still very, very restrictive. You can think of the camshaft like a broom, pretty much you, you hold it in your hands and you push all the valves simultaneously with this broomstick. What the free valve system does is that each valve becomes individual. So if you think of the valves like uh, keys on a piano, suddenly instead of pushing all the keys at the same time with a broomstick, you, you can actually play the keys with your fingers, which is the free uh, valve idea. And then of course the engine can perform in a completely different way than being forced in, into a preset pattern of combustion. So what we're gonna show you here is, uh, this is like a small cutout of a cylinder head. Uh, here we have one valve, normally there are two intake valves and two exhaust valves. But here is just a, a, a small rig to, to run one of these free valve actuators. So basically here you have the valve, here you have the actuator, it goes into like this. This is uh, lubricated by engine oil and pressurized by, by pressurized air which acts like an air hammer to move this out. Then uh, the engine oil makes sure it stays stable and can lock it in different positions and then air or, or a metal spring, air spring or a metal spring pushes it back. 
So we have individual control over each valve, which brings great benefit to, to the combustion cycles in the engine. So it's actually a snowballing effect. The engine becomes lighter, smaller, cheaper, cleaner. It can change the look of the car in the end. So it's, it's a very, very interesting technology that I'm sure one way or the other will conquer the cylinder heads of, of the world. So let's talk about next year. What do we have coming up on Drive in 2014? An embarrassment of riches, Michael. Mm, embarrassment of riches. Um, first of all, we have got some more driven. That would be right, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, investigating something to do with Quattro, which could be interesting. Yes. Inside Quattro. Exactly, inside, qu inside Quattro. <laughs> that could be really wrong in the context of Susie Quattro, couldn't it? Oh. Inside Quattro. Susie Quattro. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, also known as... Would you like to be inside Quattro? As Leather Tuscadero. Would you like to be inside Quattro? Hmm. Not, maybe not these days. <laughs> um, then we've also got a new series of shorter videos about more ordinary cars. That's right, which we talked about on the uh, Los Angeles. And I do show. believe you have shot some of those, haven't you, Michael? I have. So you might see me driving something. Could be very this good. Year. The, and brevity is your strong point, isn't it? <laughs> so we gave Mike, we gave Michael the brief of shooting a three-minute uh, in-car piece, and yeah. after 38 minutes, um, <laughs> we said cut. So we've got a load of those, and if, if YouTube servers can carry all the uh, all the weight, then we'll broadcast some of them. Some of those were fantastic. I mean, there was me punch. There's me punching a steering wheel. There is you punching. You did get really angry, didn't you? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. I'm going to introduce another show for Q1 next year, which we're all very fond of. But you have to do it in a way you once did it on Drive Central, which is can you can you do your big muscle, please? Big muscle. <laughs> So there's another load of Musto driving wacky stuff, which is going to be fantastic. Um, Sorry, I did not look at the camera. Hold on one more time. Big Musto! Do that one more time, because we might be able to... Big... <laughs> Fuck. Big Musto! So, I mean, I, you know, really, the, w would you know where that came from? No. Because I was imitating what it would be like if his show was on a cable channel. Oh, okay. Big like, Musto! That's not a bad impression. Sorry. You like that? Okay, okay go ahead. Fantastic. You were saying? Uh, I have got some bits and bobs to drive as well, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking F-type coupe. There might be a little squirt in one of those early yes. in the year. Um, we're all going to go to the Detroit Motor Show and cause trouble yep. um, and not be objective at all. Uh, <laughs> th there's some good stuff coming up in, yeah. in the first quarter, things like maybe Porsche and McCann's. Is it McCann or McCann? I think that's coming uh, up. McCann. McCann, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're a bit weather limited, but the moment the sun comes out and it gets less slippery, we'll go out and spank some more supercars. Yeah. And uh, we'll be back at Koenigsegg a little bit. We'll see what's going on, because they have some interesting stuff coming up uh, to look at. And uh, what else? What am I missing? And that's it? Um, oh yeah, we have uh, another Jalopnikon drive coming. Uh, ancient sobs, but that's much better than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's it. And we have a lot of. No, it's a lot of another year on drive. It's our third. We're approaching our third year. What have we learned, Chris, this year? Oh my God, I don't even know how to answer that. We've learned that it's quite tiring doing this, that it's very rewarding, that we're very thankful for people that watch it. Yes. And we love doing it, and we hope that's reflected in the joyfulness of the content, um, that maybe we try and do too much sometimes, and we should try and strive to do things at higher quality. But basically, we're just thankful to JF and his massive piece. And to that, we say, Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king. Peace, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the chorus of the... Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> this thing's wild. Look at it's got hair all over it. Our fur. It's like there was a cat sleeping on it. Yeah. First thing I'm looking at is actually the seals. Look at these seals. Those things are shot. Wow. Well, it is, you know, it's been sitting for over 20 years. Is it sitting in mud or something, or? No, it was just, it was in a, uh, in a garage in a house, and it's just been, it actually had blankets on it, so uh, it's just since the blankets came off that their cat went on it, but there's, uh, there's like no mice damage, apparently. 
it's which like a is cat cool. exploded on this. Look at all this. <laughs> <laughs> this is so crazy. What happens to cats in certain environments? Can we open it or? Yeah, kind of why not? This is kind of a big deal right here. Ooh, see it? A little sticky? Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, these are toast. But still, look at how good that interior is. Wow. It's in great shape. Yeah, it is actually pretty good. There, there's wow. definitely something living in here, though. <laughs> look at all this yeah. fur. <laughs> but you know what? This is a really nicely optioned no, car. No, I mean, this is like stuff that you can clean, and it, it's going to come up. And look at the steering wheel. That you know what? That's an option. That's the wood wheel. That's worth a ton of money. Wow. And it's got the five gauges. Ah, oh, this is a really nice sheet. Look at Blah Punk Radio. Oh yeah, look at that. This is a nice unit. Yeah. All right, let's uh let's roll it outside and kind of get it in the light and see see what we have. Let's, does it have the Porsche door close here? Wow, listen to that. Nice. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> After all these years. Look at this. Look it at still this. sounds good. Look at all this. Wow. Right. This is cool. All right, well, I'm going to go out on a, a limb here and say that it's not actually running. Um, supposedly it runs, but I don't think we should start it. I think okay. we're better off pushing it. That's, <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. Yes. Oh, hear it? Oh, yeah, they're dragging. Oh, wow. That's a nice green. It's really cool. Yeah, this is called Irish green, actually. It was, it was not the most popular color, but... It's uh, about, f I think like 14% ended up in this color. This was produced in 65, but it was late 65, so it was a 66 model year car, um, which they actually kind of split up the production in 65 between the two, between the two years. So what is it on the? That's the last year it was registered, which is 1990, yeah. No, but why is it in a 66 though? Because it was a 66, it's considered a 66 production year. What happened was they produced um, halfway through the 1965 model run of production, they switched over from 65 to 66 in terms of what the cars were considered. So if you have a number under a certain point, it's considered a 65. If it's over a certain point, even though it was produced in the exact same year. Really? It's weird. It's the way they did it. That is weird. But that's cool. That's uh, yeah. So this is late late '65 production for '66. Can you uh, pull? While I'm pulling yeah. this, can you lift that? Up? I'm guessing Absolutely. the spring is not. Uh, uh, yeah, that's not staying up on its own. But yeah. wow. The big thing is looking at that number. Yeah, there's the engine number. Seven four. Well, yeah, it's all there. Wow, look at the spider webs. <laughs> it's cool. That is cool. I think we're the first person to open this in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's uh, measure this paint. All right. Thank you, Chris, for showing up <laughs> in our fair city for, uh, for the festivities, the, the, the pre-Christmas, which is called uh, pre-Christmas, I believe you call it in your country. <clears throat> Pre-Christmas. Do we? I don't know. What country are you from again? So continue. All right, what? So, they speak English in what? <laughs> Say what again? Mother